When I walked through icy fields When I slept on beds of snow So this piece right here is called Rhapsody, but at the beginning I had a completely different title for it. It was going to I was going to title it That's Life. Uh, I started this piece in March 2020 when pretty much all the pandemic and lockdown started and I felt quite a bit of anxiety. I was trying to put a little bit of control, more control into my thoughts in a studio. So I stopped working on the other pieces that I was working on and I started this piece. I started with just, it has like actually consists, this piece consists of three panels and initially I was thinking of just having one panel and it was supposed to be as a composition horizontal rather than vertical. But as I kept working on it, I just felt like it was still not expressing what I wanted to express with that piece. So I kept adding and I pretty much continued to paint on this painting throughout the 2020. So at some point I was going to call it 2020 because of the chaos and then me trying to put some kind of control into it by using the marks and the detail, very meditative kind of process. So when someone look at this piece, it should kind of have, they might respond like they look at it and they don't know what they're looking at, or they can have an intel, they, were trying, they can try to find some meaning in it or some images in it or they can um, respond to it at the physical or emotional level or intellectual level. And I would like the more response I receive from viewers, the more I feel like they connected with the piece and what it's supposed to be. So one of the pieces that I started this year were portraits, and those are obviously inspired by the human emotion and complexities of life. Uh, this right here is the, actually my, one of my first portraits in this specific style. Uh, it started just as a sketch, uh, some kind of exercise that I wanted to work on and see because I have not done those kind of paintings in the past. But then I just started to work on it and I really loved how the, the, the way how I was working with the color and the texture, how that was developing and how that was giving the, that, uh, port the specific person that I was painting, which I don't know, it is anonymous, I don't know this person. The title of this piece is Checkered, which can be interpreted in many different ways. It can be checkered by life and life experiences. It can be checkered because he's wearing a checkered shirt, or it can be a checkered, uh, just the texture of the face and the, the wrinkles and the, how the color and technique is applied to pretty much describe this uh, person. When I, somebody looks at my artwork, I don't want them to only consider what it is, but I also want them to invite them consider how it is created. And uh, like I like would like the viewer to spend more time with the painting rather than just looking in a few seconds and walking away. And I think that it's the often the how something is created or the personal handwriting of the artist gives the viewer a kind of more unique experience.
Hello, Contra crowd, and welcome to another virtual Contra. This is your caller, Morgan, and this month I'm bringing you Spring Fever by Tony Parks. This is in our normal, duple and proper, and we will start with a gent on the caller's left and their partner across from them. From there, we alternate down the line. Your partner is across from you, and your neighbor is beside you. This dance starts with long lines forward and back. Take hands down the line and walk forward for three and stomp on four. Then back up for three again and stomp on four. This movement takes eight counts. Next up, we have a neighbor swing. Face your neighbor and swing for eight counts, ending with the lady on the right. This sets us up for gents all on left one and a half times. Gents reach across with left hands into the center and turn around each other one and a half times to end on the same side as your partner. This takes eight counts. From here, we're gonna do a partner swing. You swing your partner for eight counts, ending with the lady on the right. Now you're gonna take hands in a circle for a circle left all the way around. This takes eight counts. Now we're going to star left. Everyone reach into the center with their left hands to star left all the way around until back in place. This takes eight counts. Next, we're going to promenade across the set. Take right hands to right hands and left hands to left hands with your partner and walk across the set with gents passing left shoulders in the middle and keeping hands together, simply turn to face the center of the set. This takes eight counts. If the hand placement is confusing, you can also just take inside hands. Next up, we're going to have a ladies chain. Ladies, take right hands in the center and pull past each other. Give that left hand to the gent in front of you and courtesy turn into place. This takes eight counts. And that is the end of Spring Fever. Long lines forward and back. Neighbors swing. Gents, all of them on left, one and a half times. 
partner swing. Circle left. Star left. Promenade across. Ladies chain. Long lines forward and back. Neighbor swing. Jen saw my left one and a half times. Partner swing. Circle left. Star left. Promenade across. Ladies chain. Long lines forward and back. Neighbor swing. Jet Solomon left one and a half times. Partner swing. Circle left. Star left. Promenade across. Ladies chain. Long lines forward and back. Neighbor swing. Gents all on my left one and a half times. Partner swing. Circle left. Star left. Promenade across. Ladies chain. Hi, I'm Alex Webster and I'm here in Studio 2 at CASP and I'm so glad that you're joining us this evening for our virtual First Friday Art Trail um, in part with Luca and all of these incredible arts organizations across Lubbock. The two pieces uh, that you will see in just a few moments have been written by Texas Tech students who are currently in recovery. And this is a part of a bigger project um, with the Association of Students About Service. And this is part of a conference. It's actually going to be held tomorrow, March 6th, all day. Um, it will be virtual, so if you're interested in more information, um, feel free to go to Association of Students About Service um, on Facebook. You can check out Texas Tech's website. Um, for the Addiction Recovery Center um, to talk about recovery um, and all and all of its different facets. Um, right now, during COVID, uh, after speaking with a lot of the folks over there, um, they have been creating incredible paths to finding and discovering community in a time when it's really difficult to. And so, please about recovery is a series of projects um, that involve students from the Addiction Recovery Center, um, the Associations for Students About Service, um, and some other Texas Tech School of Theater and Dance folks. Um, and we are coming together uh, again to really bring the arts and recovery together to create community. And so if you are watching this and you are looking for resources for recovery, um, feel free to reach out to StarCare, O-S-A-R, which is Outreach Screening Assessment and Referral. And their phone number is 806-740-1421. And you can also talk to the folks at the City of Lubbock Health Department Substance Use Services Network. And they will be more than happy to help you and help you find resources. And thank you so much for joining us for this first Friday. And uh, please check out the website for more information about the virtual conference tomorrow. Thanks so much. Enjoy these pieces.
Recovery at the Bottom of the Ocean by Nick McCord. I hit my two year mark alone. And by alone, I mean without AA or rehab or a program, though I know that helps people sometimes, all the time, maybe, whatever. I mean, I woulda latched my hook to the sober ship with everyone else who's drowning in it, but sitting still is pretty fundamental to the whole group thing. AA, they want you to be still and know he is watching over you, there for you, a higher power for your addiction. And I think whose backwards pantheon is this? Because Plano Church alone doesn't pull a ring of drunks into some waterlogged basement on Wednesday nights across the country. No, ma'am. We were touched by an even greater God, an almighty with fire and hatred so keen it lasts beyond some weekly fix. Forget memorizing hymns. I could sling you a half dozen psalms about the cold fire of scotch whiskey tunneling down and through my human soul that calls me by name on the fiery hillside in an equally mystical, oaky, barrel-aged bane and balm of Gilead. I could do that if you let my attic brain go deaf for a night. But it wouldn't anyway. I can't. Because your junk's not looking for salvation. He's looking to hide. He's looking to run. Like, like Jonah and the whale. You ever wonder if Jonah didn't want to know God? If maybe he just hated him? Like, if maybe this chaste dude pursued down to the depths of the ocean and to the guts of a flippin' fish wasn't just fleeing a decades-long abusive relationship with some guy who wouldn't leave him alone as he was walking home alone at night every night? Who cat called him up from the seabed to see his smile? And maybe he just got tired of saying no over and over again, and so his no became a fine, and his fine turned into a just once, and that ugly tumbled into a votion of hurry. He was so weary of hearing his name. Jonah, 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 know me, drink me. Drown your briny little fish tongue in my voice that only ever says your stupid name. And lo, that little sailor is always already pursued for life. For life. Ugh. No thank you, ma'am. No thank you. I've already got a God that I'm running from. Praying my little hidey hole sobriety gets eaten by a bigger whale that gets eaten by a bigger one and that one eaten and eaten and eaten until I'm buried in a chain of mountain of whales stacked to the moon and even then you can bet I'll hear it wheedling through thick miles of blubber and scales that trickling God that liquid voice whining Jonah Jonah Jonah, seek me, find me, worship me, until you're drowned forever. Not gonna lie, it's pretty bleak. Why have company for it? Pretend I don't hear my name from every faucet and bucket, begging for every moment of my eternal attention? It's more than Jonah had to deal with. You can't circle up and share your feelings away from that. You have to run. A letter during COVID. Being in recovery both before and during COVID has been an interesting experience to say the least. When I first came into the rooms, there were so many people and everyone was hugging and talking and all grouped together. I even remember thinking that there was no way these people were clean because of how happy and close they were to each other. There was a huge sense of community, family even. 
We all hung out before and after meetings, going to movies, dinners, hookah lounges, everything. I was able to feel like a, a part of the community almost immediately because of the ease of connectivity between everyone there. In COVID, things have been very different. I moved to a new place and had to create a whole new network. Though I was able to form a new community, it took some time and my network is much smaller than it used to be. The stipulations from the CDC have made it hard to really connect with people. When in-person meetings were shut down, I watched a lot of people, especially newcomers, relapse. As having a network and strong relationship with others in recovery is a key aspect of maintaining sobriety, COVID took a real toll on me and a lot of the people I know in the rooms. As the pandemic has progressed and meetings have opened back up, the sense of community has started to come back. And I can't wait for things to get back to normal so that the rooms can be a welcoming place for newcomers and old timers alike. Welcome to Lupa Galleries. We're going to be talking about Dario Pacelli's A Kind of Orienting Strategy. In the exhibition, A Kind of Orienting Strategy, Buccelli explores the dynamics and relationships of viewing paintings online versus in person with what he calls the embodied perception and the cognitive experience. The body and mind dichotomy highlights our physical distance from an art object. The virtual world of the internet allows us to see artistic processes and intimate views of lives and spaces. Through his work, Buccelli confronts the effects of our perceptions by viewing paintings online. With Dario Buccelli's Explorer, we're offered a gallery space that's empty. It has seven paintings on the wall, and it's almost as if the viewer can step right in. However, we are blocked by a pop-up, demanding agreement for the use of cookies by visiting the site. This is not an image of the gallery. It is a painting of the image of the gallery. This highlights just what Buccelli is concerned with. In his work, Open an App, we are confronted with the effects of social media applications. In this piece, we are offered a gallery space, yet we begin to understand how our experiences can be hindered by social media applications and the platforms that we use. Another important factor that Buccelli addresses are the formal elements of painting. Texture can often be misread in photographs, and even though zoom is offered, it cannot always be comprehended through online viewing. Scale is also an important factor. When we use our devices, such as smartphones or computers, we cannot also always tell the scale of paintings. In Buccelli's piece Zoom, we are given a painting by Corey Archangel. In the left corner, we are given the full painting, yet the whole painting itself is a zoomed-in version. We are also offered the zoom-in, zoom-out, and other navigable options. However, unbeknownst to the viewer, Corey Archangel's piece is actually a digital painting, rendering the zoom option useless. Buccelli highlights the gap between a viewer and an art object while viewing online. A gap that cannot be bridged by photography. It can only be fulfilled by being physically present in front of an art object. One day I decided to purchase a camera. The rest, as they say, is history. My name is Tim Harris, a nature photographer, and I live in North Fort Worth near the Speedway with my wife of 10 years. Our yard consists of four gorgeous crepe myrtles, baldo brush, purple fountain grass, honeysuckle, plenty of bird feeders, and number of bird baths. 
Through the seasons, my yard hosts nearly 30 species of birds, from jays, hawks, and owls, to the smallest of sparrows, juncos, and finch. My wife and I have worked long and hard to make our yard habitable for as many species as possible due to the overdevelopment of lands nearby. And if I'm lucky enough, the birds have their portraits taken for free. When winter is in full retreat, I travel out to a pond near my house to capture the first Texas wildflowers in full bloom. If nature were a palette, the months of March, April, and May would be my canvas. I usually have two lenses at my side, a telephoto for the birds passing through on spring migration, and a macro for the Indian blankets, paintbrush, pink evening primrose, Texas bluebell, Mexican hat, wine cups, basket flower, and Texas thistle flowers in between. Cooling off or thawing out, I can be found viewing the day's visual hall in my den, then creating archival prints celebrating nature in all her splendor. Observers of my bird and flower prints think I travel far and wide for my photography. I just can't help but smile. Nope. I just photograph outside my doorstep. We all need to be aware of the true natural diversity we currently possess. All you have to do is plant some flowers, a few shrubs in your backyard, or even a tree. Anything is better than nothing. That's why I document nature, print, and sell my work. Welcome to Luca. We are exhibiting Ed Barr's Make Dominant Objects in our studio gallery. Ed Barr is a sculptor living in Dallas, Texas. Ed Barr uses formal elements such as texture and color to create a relationship with the viewer that is more than just a simple glance. With his large, unconventional, and unique sculptures, Ed Barr does just what he aims to do, attract and hold a viewer's gaze. With his art speed series, Ed Barr uses heavy canvas, leather, and zippers to critique the media narratives of the art world. Barr critiques the academic jargon of the art world and often leaves the viewer or readers with light comprehension or confusion. This, in turn, perpetuates the exclusivity of the art world. Barr then critiques the critics. He uses words, sometimes offensive, to switch the narrative of the art world. He creates a satirical space that we can laugh at with words like puppy. Another sculpture we encounter is Plymouth, which we can associate with the early colonies of North America around 1620. This new Plymouth represents social turmoil and problems within the United States now that reflect back on the structures of our daily lives. This sculpture stands as a monument which parallels the graffiti on the actual Plymouth rock. Debris surrounds this piece like an ocean, a symbol of mankind. With Sober, I'm an Atheist, we see a large cocoon object, large enough to hold a person. Chained next to it is a bottle of alcohol. The cocoon represents the confined spaces of modern culture that we're encased in, and the alcohol represents that intoxication can be a way to escape those confinements of modern society. The alcohol is a catalyst in which other states of mind can be reached. Far attracts the viewer's gaze with his unique sculptures, and he holds it with what lies beneath the surface, not holding back even when critics seem to barricade the art world.
first class She's got some bloody knees Doing what she pleases It's so ugly Not free Now she's walking Through the night Only looking For a ride For a ride She's got some memories Hanging out behind her as she's lonely Never even knew her name Except the one somebody gave her One day It's okay now she's walking through the night Only looking for a ride She's heading through the door Anymore Anymore Baby's up and gone away She'll be back again